right, good morning. Yes, that's a fresh reInvents audience right there, <laughs> right? That's Monday morning. My name's Keith Jarrett. This morning I have with me Megan Kennedy and Tim Treston from Vanguard Investments, and this is Enterprise 302, all right? Cost optimization. All right, so before we get in, you know, acknowledging that this is probably the first stop for a lot of you in your reInvent 2018 journey, just want to take a quick minute and welcome you guys. This is going to be a very exciting week. There's a lot to come, right? And hopefully we can kind of kick things off on the right foot, right, and get this party started. All right, so before we get too far in, um, just by a show of hands, how many folks in the audience actually work within your company's finance organization? Oh, good. Probably about a third of folks. How many folks work directly with your finance organization? Daily, weekly, okay, like about half of you. For folks who didn't raise their hand, how many folks know what finance is, <laughs> right? If you didn't raise your hand, spoiler alert, this may be the wrong room for you. Uh, but we're happy to have you, All right? So again, my name's Keith Jarrett. I run our global cost optimization program at AWS, All right? And the spirit of our team is really work directly with you, our customers, to really run the most cost-effective lean applications possible. That's really it, right? Work with you guys to find areas where you can save on your AWS bill, right? And within the scope of cloud economics, right, cloud economics is really about how do we start thinking about the impact to our organization by taking advantage of this type of technology? What does it mean from a transformation perspective? Right, how does it impact the business? Right, not just from a dollars and cents perspective, but how does it allow us to do more? How does it allow us to be more agile, accelerate our innovation? Right, and how do we really unlock all that potential? Right, so that's really what we're going to talk about today. Right, because again, with so much excitement this week around new technologies, new services, right, things that allow you to innovate, Right, move quicker, right, delight your customers. Right, with all those technical objectives that we're meeting this week, right, this session is really about how do we ensure that we're meeting also our financial and business objectives. Right, so for the folks in the room, right, I'm assuming that we're all using AWS at some level. Right, some of us are still experimenting, kind of figuring it out. Right, some of us are already at scale. Right, but maybe you're spending a little bit more than you had hoped. Right? Or maybe you're just kind of looking for creative ways to pinch a penny, right? And that's okay too, right? Because with AWS, all customers are gonna pay for what they use, but cost optimization is really about ensuring that we're only paying for those resources we need and not a penny more, right? So how do we do that within our organizations, right? And that's really about this presentation today, right? We're gonna talk a little bit about how we think about cost optimization on our team, Right, conceptually, what does optimization look like for our organization? How does it fit into cloud financial management? We'll bring up the Vanguard team and they'll share their journey thus far. Right, and beyond that, our goal is to leave you guys with some specific recommendations, right? Spe specific ideas that you can take out of this room today, take back to the office next week, and really start putting into practice next month so you can immediately have an impact on your bill. All right, so let's dig in a little bit here, right? Because this isn't your traditional data center, and I want to acknowledge that up front, right? Because AWS, in addition to those costs, is really about doing more with less, right? It's about how do we do a better job of enabling you to innovate on behalf of your customers, act more agile, right, and accelerate that development process, right? So there's a huge opportunity for our customers, and we've heard that story before, right? But when we work with customers, a lot of times we get these kind of personas that come to us and we get that executive that says, you know, I'm really jazzed about the opportunity to reduce my cost structure, right? And that's awesome, that's great, right? But we also get that executive that's, you know, I'm really excited about all the innovation and acceleration we can do. That's awesome too, right? But our job is to make sure that we're focusing on that not being an either or decision, but really an and decision, right? How do we make sure that we're thinking about that as two sides of the same coin, Right, and taking advantage of both sides. Right, because fundamentally, in a lot of ways, we've essentially changed the way that our IT and engineering teams are creating value. 
right? How they are thinking about unlocking all of those opportunities. Because really at the core of it, it's an opportunity for us to think about how do we manage our business differently? Right? How to architect our applications differently? Right? How do we think about organizing or operating in a different way? <clears throat> and that's a story that we've heard before, right? We've heard our customers talk about this. We've heard about GE talking about how they were able to reduce their total cost of ownership by 52%, right? Through use of higher services and managed services like RDS, right? We've heard it from Live Nation who was able to reduce their total cost of ownership by 58%, right? But by doing things like right sizing, right? Identifying idle or wasteful EBS volumes and really creating a process to proactively identify those things, right? We've heard it from Intuit. Right, who was on stage with us last year talking, or two years ago, talking about how they were able to reduce their unit economics by 40%, even while they were scaling by 70%. Right, so that's a story we've heard before. Right? And the opportunity is out there, but just like most opportunities, there's a rub. Right? The catch is that this isn't your old-fashioned data center. So my advice to you is don't use it that way. Right? We've got to think about how we become more cloudy and how we unlock those opportunities. And just because you're using EC2 doesn't make you cloudy. So what are those things that are gonna have the most impact on our bill, right? And one of the things we've said in past reinvents is that, look, there are things that are defining customers who are being successful in this space, right? We see them doing the same things over and over again, right? And those five activities that they're doing are things that we call our five pillars of cost optimization, right? And it's a process that starts with making sure we're picking our right instances, right? It's looking at the resources we've deployed and asking ourselves, how are we using those resources, right? And where are the opportunities for us to downsize those instances where possible, All right? It's increasing our application elasticity, right? Making sure we're using a resource when we need it, turning it off when we don't, right? That's foundational to why we're here, right? But as customers figure out how to start operationalizing that through you know, scheduling functions through auto scaling, right? They're able to do that as they scale, right? So once we picked our right instances, we're running elastically, using our eyes to cover our always on resources, right? And outside of compute, it's how we think about optimizing our storage environments, right? So for our EBS volumes, identifying those detached or idle volumes, right? Identifying volumes that should be running as a different type, for our cold storage solution, looking at ways we can move that to our AWS Glacier or S3 and frequent access cold storage solution. But beyond these technical levers, right, the secret sauce is really how do we start operationalizing this, right? How do we start doing this in a repeatable way, right? And that's really what is making customers successful here, right? So I'm hoping that some folks in the room have seen this construct before, right? It's a, it's a construct that we introduced a couple years ago all right, we had Intuit up here talking about how impactful it was for their organization. We talked about how we've seen customers deploy this and save up to 84% off their bill. Right, we heard it from Expedia last year was able to reduce their bill by 20% as they grew 250%. So the opportunity is significant, right? But as we started thinking about today, right, we started thinking about how we want to tell this story, right? We've talked about cost optimization and passion. There's a lot of white papers, documentation, case studies. If you haven't seen those, I encourage you to take a look at them, right? But as we started thinking about our time today, right, one of the things I kept thinking about is, you know, why certain customers are so naturally gravitating to that five pillar framework, right? And why other customers are maybe a little bit slower to adopt it. Right? As a team of economists, we just started asking ourselves why, right? Why is that? And the answer that we found was that it typically is rooted in the way businesses operate, right? The way they do business planning, the way they do financial planning. It's not necessarily about knowing what to do, it's about knowing how to do it. So we want to talk a little bit about that because I think fundamentally, the cloud has really changed the way our IT and our finance departments interact, like the way these two teams typically interface. And at its core, we've essentially disrupted this procurement process, right? 
The procurement of physical infrastructure is a process that has been commonly refined and learned over a couple decades, right? So it's a comparatively slower process, but it's one that I think is generally well known, right? It's a process where an engineering team says, here's what we want, right? A procurement team acts as a centralized approver, right? And then they go manage the cost, manage the vendors, and manage that process. Right, and so what we get is a process that I think generally works really well for a finance organization. Right? It gives us visibility into our costs, anticipating what our costs are gonna be, right? being able to anticipate what our depreciation of those assets will be. Right? But as we do that, we get a process that may work for the finance organization, but less so for the IT organization, right? or the business as a whole. Right? Because it's a long process. Right? We're able to measure what we have, but it doesn't do a good job of answering, should we have that, right? What do we actually need? And inherently at the core of this is, we're raising the stakes on innovation, right? The cost of experimentation, right? The cost of failure in this model is high, right? So again, it doesn't necessarily meet the needs of the organization, right? And I think what we've seen over the last you know, number of years is that our IT team has kind of started figuring a way around this. Right, you need a server quick, cool. Let's put up an innovation center in AWS. Right, and that's a really cool thing from a business agility perspective. It allows us to move quickly. Right, but now what we've done is we've left the finance organization out of this process. Right, equally undesirable outcome. Right, so the, pro the question is really, then how do we start redesigning this process in a way that makes sense for the cloud? Right, and it's a process that really starts with, okay, well, what are our business Goals, what do we want to achieve? Right. How are we going to measure those goals? Right. How are we going to deliver them as cost effectively as possible? Right. And then how are we going to operationalize it? How are we going to scale it up? Right. And that's really what we want to show with this type of process. Right. Start with that planning and budgeting forecast. Understand the needs of the business, right. how you anticipate using the platform, how are you going to budget for that, right. how that's going to impact your bill, Right? And then how do we create the visibility within your environment to make sure that, okay, now that we're using it, how do we make sure that we're holding people accountable? Right? We're measuring the right things, and we're getting data into the hands of the people that can make decisions. Right? And so after those first steps, that's kind of where we see our traditional cost optimization process step in, right? Okay, now we're here, like, let's make sure we're picking the right instances. All right, let's make sure that we are operating elastically. Let's make sure that we are using spot in our eyes where possible and optimizing our storage, right? And then again, creating that operational model that allows us to scale, right? That supports this whole process end to end. And so similar to our cost optimization framework, how our mental model works, what we did is we said, okay, well, what is defining customers' success in this space? If we look at those who are doing it well, what are they doing? Right, and the things that they are doing are they're investing in those capabilities that go beyond just cost optimization. Right, it's an acknowledgement of how that process has to change. Right, so at the core of this, you know, this capability model, which we call the cloud financial management framework, right, is cost optimization. Right, it's those things we talked about. How do we architect in a more cloud-friendly way? Right, but it does include those other aspects around financial planning and budgeting, right? measurement and accountability, and then around this operational model, acknowledging the fact that we can't solve all technology problems by throwing more technology at it. Just, unfortunately, it doesn't work that way all the time. Right? We gotta be able to approach this more from a people and process perspective, right? make sure we're setting up the right teams, implementing the right processes, Right, driving that governance and automation, and really stripping a lot of the manual pieces out of this framework. Right, so as we talk today, I wanna kinda reshift our focus right, into this type of framework, because I think that this is the type of thing that will make an organization successful. A lot of the questions we get, right, beyond just how do I lower my bill, is how do I get better visibility into that? Like, back up a step, right? Before right-sizing my instance, tell me how I get that visibility, right? Tell me how I do a better job of cost reporting, 
tell me how I do a better job of tracking certain metrics and KPIs with my, within my organization, right? So it's a how question. And for us, it's a four-step process, right? So if we dig into measurement and accountability within that framework specifically, I want to touch on these four steps. It starts with making sure we have the right account strategy in place. I actually reviewed this deck with a couple guys on my team. I don't think they're here. I sent them the deck. I said, you know, hey, what do you guys think? Ron comes back and he's like, account strategy? Really? He goes, you don't think everybody in that room is going to know their account strategy? And I said, no, I don't think so. Because it really depends on what got you into this room today, right? Because again, I think a lot of times our evolution and usage of the platform kind of happens organically, right? It's like, okay, we'll start with the project over here, maybe a certain application over here, right? And it, this kind of organic growth process that all of a sudden becomes scale. Right? And that's a different process than a large enterprise kind of kicking off this large scale migration and saying, okay, we're going to invest in the planning process up front and we're going to set this strategy. Right? In both cases, it's important for us to articulate what that strategy is, but oftentimes it isn't quite there. Right? Because at the heart of it, you think about what that account strategy looks like, at the heart of it is really got to be an acknowledgement of how do we automate and how we govern our usage. All right, so I want to take a couple minutes just to talk about AWS organizations and how, that that is, how that's really working for customers in this space. Because AWS organizations is a policy-based management tool that allows customers to group accounts, automate the account creation process, it allows you to apply and manage permissions to those accounts, and then it allows you to do consolidated billing reporting for your organization. Right, so it's a really important piece of the puzzle because what it allows us to do is say, okay, as I'm bringing on my new development teams, right, I want to automate the account creation for that process. I want to use CloudFormation templates to set the correct permission model for that account. And I can do that directly through the, cost, uh, through the AWS organization's API so it becomes a repeatable, scalable process to make sure that all of our accounts are adhering to our corporate governance and compliance rules. So if we look at customers who are using organizations, right, we tend to see a couple different account strategies kind of bubble to the surface. Right, organizations on its own isn't a kind of strict hierarchy-based construct, right, but customers can set up these logical groupings in order to create that type of model for their organization. And the first common account structure that we see is what we call uh, our business unit account structure. Right? So for those organizations that have defined lines of businesses or, or business units, who have distinct autonomy, right? they run their own operations, their own IT, their own costs, right? this can be a really helpful tool. Our second account structure is environmental lifecycle. Right? So for those customers that want to align their operational and cost reporting to a application lifecycle phase, this is a good model. Right? It's typically best for those more traditional uh, IT organizations right, that have distinct responsibilities between application lifecycle development. Right? And that comes in contrast with our last, our last account structure, which is the project-based account structure. Right, and this is an account structure that I think really works well for those DevOps environments. Right, those teams that are managing a specific application or workload. Right, those teams that have, uh, are managing those applications end to end and do both your IT administration as your operations. And what happens is when we take these types of account structures and we couple it with a tagging strategy that tells us who's using the resource and for what purpose, right, all of a sudden we get this rich data that enables us to do better cost reporting, even for the most complex organization. All right, we can take that a step further and say, okay, well, let's also make sure that we're driving some visibility into situations where we're going above what we had hoped. Right? So we can use budgets and alarms to set account thresholds so that you'll receive a notification that will tell you when your account is going above your desired threshold. Right? So we can take action. So our first step, make sure we got the right account strategy in place. Right? Step two, make sure we got the right tagging strategy in place. Tags, 
Probably not the most exciting feature you're gonna talk about this week. I'll give you that. But DAGs are a really critical piece to this puzzle, and we have to acknowledge the role that they play in this process, right? Because tags can do a lot of things for us, including helping us do better resource allocation, do better automation, make sure we're driving that scheduling function, make sure we're driving that auto-scaling policy, right? They are critical enablers of accurate cost, uh, cost reporting or chargeback or showback models, all right? And really just driving that control and compliance within the organization, right? So we need to make sure that we're not just skipping over the step and we're confronting it, acknowledging its criti criticality in the process, and setting up the right process to do that. Right? And that's a process that starts with acknowledging that we need to create an account or a tagging strategy right, that really meets the various needs of the organization. Right? Set up our tag strategy so that we're getting the right cost visibility, right? we're driving the right permissions governance, and that we're really being sensitive to that organizational hierarchy and management reporting lines, so that we're designing a tagging strategy that gives the appropriate visibility across the organization. Right? And one of the things that we see a lot of times with customers is that, that these five tags, example tags, are really like what we need to understand all we need to understand from a cost perspective. Right? What cost centers are tied to, which application, which individual, right? When do we expect the project to end? And then a lot of customers are actually taking it a step further and saying, okay, well, are these resources actual candidates for automation? All right, and they can allow users to opt in or opt out of that automation. All right, so for those resources that are maybe good candidates for those uh, scheduling functions, this is a good way to do it, right? Identifying those resources that are good candidates for termination at the end of the day, start stop scripts, auto archiving, Right, but what happens is we get these tags in place, all of a sudden we have a good perspective to really know how we should proceed. Right? Because if I see an always on resource, I say to myself, okay, well, it's always on resource, let's cover it with an RI. Right, well, what if the project's ending in two months? Right? Maybe not a good candidate for an RI. Right? Okay, well, so let's look at how we can increase our elasticity with scheduling or auto scaling. Right? Maybe a monolithic app, maybe they got not a great opportunity. All right, so if the question, the answer to those questions is no, all right, then I could take a step back further and say, okay, how do I think about RI portfolio management, combining these various projects and think about sharing benefits of RIs? Right, the point being is that with these types of lenses, we can do a lot of things from a financial management perspective. Right, and to do that, we have to do two things well. Right, we have to make sure that we have a standard applied case sensitive tag framework. And we gotta make sure we're doing it, right? We gotta make sure that all of our resources are being tagged, right? And we think that these are two good ways that we've seen customers doing that. We have two tools, AWS uh, Tag Editor, which allows you to apply tags to multiple resources. So you can tag, uh, you, can, you can search, right? And then you can apply, you can remove, you can edit tags, and then you can use AWS Config and Lambda to automate that process. So you're, auto, uh, you're automatically tagging those resources as they're spun up. Right? And more than just automating that process, you're ensuring that those resources that are spun up are being tagged the right way. Step one, count strategy. Step two, tagging strategy. Step three is making sure we're using Cost Explorer and setting up our cost reports. We've had a lot of good stuff come out from Cost Explorer this last year. All right, so if you haven't taken a look at Cost Explorer in the last year or so, I encourage you to take a second look because they've been rolling out a lot of additional features, a lot of additional functionality. And what that means for us is that out of the box, Cost Explorer allows us to answer some pretty basic common questions, like what was my spend last year? Or, or excuse me, last, last month, right? What was that spend by AZ or by region? Right? What was my usage? What was my RI coverage? What was my RI utilization? These are questions that Cost Explorer can help us answer a little bit, a little bit better. Right? And so within this suite of Cost Explorer, I think one of the things that we find a lot of value in is this cost and usage report. So I want to dig into a little bit. Right? Because this cost and usage report will show us cost and usage. It's a great brand. I love it. 
So what this shows us is the cost, here grouped by instance type above, right? Similarly, usage grouped by instance type below, right? But the, the thing that's cool about Cost Explorer is, one, it gives us a lot of rich information that we can slice a bunch of different ways, but two, it's also all this functionality is available by API. All right, so what that allows us to do is start slicing this data in a number of different ways, right? Start grouping our spend and our usage, not just by instance type, but we could do it by account, we could do it by service, right? We could do it by reason or, uh, region or AZ, right? There's a number of different ways we can kind of pivot this data, right? We can select whether we want to look at the last month, the last day, right? We can select our time horizon. And then we focus on, well, how do we make sure that we're getting this report as relevant to our organization as possible. All right, so we can use some of these filters to say, well, I only want to look at this region, or I only want to look at this AZ, right, and make sure we're getting more targeted with this analysis. And some of the things that I find a lot of value here is some of these advanced search uh, filter options, right, because a lot of the customers we talk to, you know, what they want is a very narrow, focused cost and usage report and stripping out certain costs, right? Cer stripping out certain costs that maybe aren't applicable to their organization, like shared costs, like, like support, right? Or credits and refunds or taxes, right? And so once we kind of get that drilled down on what the appropriate cost and usage report is, then we can go ahead and export that via uh, CSV. It's an accrual world out there, guys. A couple finance courtesy laughs, thank you. You know, as we start thinking about the needs of a finance organization, right, there are a couple things that for us to consider, right? That a lot of times that cash, cash out of pocket view isn't necessarily the only way we wanna look at our business, right? And a cruel view helps. And so the way we think about costs is there's a couple different lenses that we can look through here, right? We have blended costs, which removes the cost of our eyes, right? We have unblended costs, which will show how the discount of our RIs were applied throughout the month, Right? And then from the finance organization's perspective, it's really around, okay, how do we get that accrual view? How do we think about getting this kind of notion of what Cloudability calls a true cost, which reflects the amortization of that upfront RI payment option? Right? How do we do that? Well, Cost Explorer this year has uh, done a better job of enabling that type of functionality for users. So you can go into that cost and usage report, and when you get that cost and usage, you see, okay, well, Here's, here's kind of the, the case for this, right? We see the spikiness in our spend. We see that that spike is driven by a large upfront RI payment, right? But I can go in to show costs as, click my drop down, say, show me my amortized costs, right? And what I get from that is that kind of peanut butter view, right? Where we're amortizing that upfront payment over the course of the RI. And I think doing a little bit better job of making sure that we're meeting the needs of our, our finance partners. Right, so there's been a lot of additional functionality and data that's coming out of Cost Explorer. And a lot of this has been around you know, new features, but a lot of it has been around how do we get better data and better insights into the assets that we own, right? How do we better understand our usage of, of RIs, our utilization of those RIs? And one of the things we launched last year was RI purchase recommendations. So going beyond just assessing what are we doing with the assets we have, Right, it's recommendations for what additional RIs should we be purchasing, right? And that's a really powerful tool, right? But over the course of the year, we've continued to make this a little bit more helpful, right? A year ago, it was only focused on EC2, right? And now this, this type of RI recommendation can be provided at the linked account level and the payer account level, right? And it includes all RI eligible services like RDS, Redshift, Elasticash, and Elasticsearch. So our fourth and final step is leverage the partners and the experts in this space for help. So in October, we actually launched a new partner competency uh, for cost and resource management, right? And there's a lot of folks in this space who are doing really great work, right? But with the launch of this partner network, we found that these six were really leading in the space, really having a lot of impact working with customers to make sure that they're delivering the functionality that they need as an organization, All right? So if you're looking for help, this is a great place to start. So we've talked a lot about the what, right? What steps to take, what's gonna have the largest impact on your bill, 
right? But just as important as a what, right? The how is just a critical piece, right? How do we start deploying this? How do we think, you know, other customers are doing this? All right, so I'm gonna bring up um, Megan and Tim from Vanguard, but I also wanna take a moment to say, this is your open invitation, right? Because Vanguard's got a really interesting story. 12 months ago, they were sitting where you're sitting, right? Listening to us talk about cost optimization, listening to Expedia talk about the results that they had, right? And they walked out of the room and kind of looked at each other and they go, you know, we have an opportunity here to kind of approach this in a different way, right? So this is your invitation to come join us on stage next year and share some of the success that you've had in 2019. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Megan Kenny from Vanguard. Megan? Thanks, Keith. Good morning. As Keith said, my name is Megan Kennedy, and I'm a program manager at Vanguard, where I'm responsible for management of our cloud program, as well as something that we refer to as the cloud business office, which we'll get into in a minute here. Um, but first, I want to tell you a little bit about um, who we are, what we do, and then we'll get into our cloud financial management framework. Um, by show of hands, how many here have never heard of Vanguard? Okay, there's a few. So I'm gonna quickly cover some fun facts and, and maybe some of you who have heard about Vanguard might learn something here. Um, Vanguard is the largest mutual fund company in the world and we are the second largest asset management firm in the world. We have 19 offices worldwide. Our headquarters is in Malvern, Pennsylvania, which is just outside of Philadelphia. But we also have offices in London, Singapore, China, Canada, just to name a few. We employ over 16,000 crew members. Now, you might ask what a crew member is. It's our term for an employee. Um, one of the things that makes Vanguard unique is that we have many nautical references. So our employees are crew members. Vanguard itself got its name after a battleship in the Battleship of the Nile, in the Battle of the Nile, the HMS Vanguard. We have over 20 million clients in 170 countries. And for those clients, we manage $5.2 trillion in assets. So we are by no means a small company, but there is something that's pretty unique about us. Um, and that's important to touch on in a presentation where we're talking about cost optimization. What's unique about us is our ownership structure. So essentially, clients own Vanguard funds and Vanguard funds own Vanguard. So essentially, we are owned by our clients. And that's very different from many other investment management firms where they are owned by an outside fund company and those outside fund, that outside fund company has owners that it has to look for a profit from. So any profits at Vanguard actually get generated right back to the clients in the form of lower expenses in the funds that we're managing on their behalf. So low cost, economies of scale as an operating model, does that sound familiar? It should, I mean, it's very similar to AWS's operating model. And that's one of the things that makes our relationship between Vanguard and AWS work really well. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about our cloud journey. And when we talk about our cloud journey, we like to talk of it um, with two lenses. Um, the first lens at the top of this timeline is the enablement lens. Think of that as our um, cloud engineering teams building platform capabilities out. And in the bottom part of this graph, underneath the timeline, you'll see a migration lens. And you can think of that as um, our LOBs or our app dev teams taking advantage of those capabilities that the platform teams enabled. So we began our journey to public cloud in early 2016. And very quickly, by the end of that year and early into 2017, we delivered a series of MVP releases um, for our web apps, for analytic, analytics applications, and also third-party packages. So we delivered baseline capabilities and then piloted those capabilities with a few um, applications. And then we continued to iterate our way through a series of capability enablement, followed by workload migrations for analytics, for web applications, and also for third-party packages. 
And we're gonna continue this pattern into 2019 where we continually deliver thin slice capabilities followed by waves of application migration. But we did have this key inflection point at the end of 2017 um, where we started to see our costs rise and we had only begun um, our migration path. So we thought we needed to put some governance and structure in, into place and we instituted this thing called a cloud business office or a CBO. So think of the CBO as a central group that uh, manages all the stakeholders involved in your cloud journey. So for example, at the top of this chart, you see that um, we are interacting with our line of business software delivery teams. We're, really what we're trying to do there is deliver a consistent and effective user experience for those teams and put out design patterns that can be reused across the firm so that those uh, lines of business are not relearning in their silos. On the left, you see that we work with the security controls and risk teams. And what we do there is we ensure that our cloud platforms and our applications are wrapped with the appropriate security, legal, and compliance controls. On the right, well, we interface with our procurement team. One of the things that we do with, with them is anytime a new AWS service comes out and we want to take advantage of it, we make sure that we review the service terms and that our procurement and legal teams sign off on those terms. And we also put out best practices on how to use those services. So again, that those best practices can be, can be reused across the organization. We also interface um, between the lines of business and our cloud engineering team. So the lines of business, think of them as clients of our platform and we're listening to them in terms of what kind of capabilities they want enabled in the platform, and then we relay that to the cloud engineering teams so that they can factor those capabilities into their um, delivery plans. Last but not least is financial management, and this is what we're gonna spend the rest of the time on in this presentation here. One of the major functions of the CBO is to manage our AWS bill and optimize the costs. So really, what you can think of in terms of the CBO, think of it as a concierge. A concierge between the lines of business app dev teams and all the other stakeholders within your firm that are really interested in making sure that your platforms and applications are being developed in a well-architected manner. Um, in case you were wondering, this CBO group is actually only three people. Um, one person is an automation engineer and he does a lot of automation around our governance and policies that we've decided to put in place around costs. Uh, one of the other people in this group is Tim, who's gonna come up here in a minute, and he's an ex-finance guy who wanted to get a little technically savvy. So that, we found that that combination of having somebody who is a finance person coupled with somebody who's an automation engineer is a really powerful combination to have within your CBO. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the path that we were on with our EC2 hours. Um, this chart here, this solid purple line, tells you what our EC2 hours were from about uh, January 2017 to about November 2017. And if you recall from the migration slide I showed you just a few minutes ago, this was just around the time where we were just putting base platform capabilities up and we had just a few workloads migrated. Now, we, had we stayed on this path, this dotted line actually shows you what our EC2 costs would have been if we did nothing. And we knew that we had a large migration effort ahead of us, which is depicted in these bars um, to the right here. So we knew we had to put that uh, governance in place, we stood up that CBO, and actually this purple line is our actual EC2 hours that we wound up seeing despite the fact that we were still you know, migrating to a, a great degree. So at the end of 2017, when we only had about 30 workloads migrated, we now at the end of 2018 have over 300 workloads migrated and we were really able to kind of um, tamp down on that cost of um, the EC2 usage. So how did we do that? Um, Tim's gonna come up and, and tell you how we did that. But quite frankly, you know, we were sitting in your shoes last year. We were sitting in the audience and we learned a lot about 
what we needed to do. We knew, we were told, hey, you have to shut down idle instances. You have to use reservations. You have to right size. So we learned a lot, but we really didn't understand how we were gonna go do that. So um, we put together a three-phase approach, and Tim's gonna talk about each of those three phases, but the first phase really started with reacting, reacting to the cost of our bill that was rising. Tim? Thanks, Megan. Uh, yeah, so this react phase is really in that fourth quarter 2017, right? We were, we were looking at that 56% growth from August to November in our EC2 hours, right? And that was really an unsustainable path that we were on, um, especially from a cost perspective, right? So we knew we had to, we had to take action, right? So there was two things we really, we didn't really know a whole lot, but we did know that there were things running that probably shouldn't be running, right? They were left running or, or weren't sized correctly. Um, and there were also things that were running that we probably shouldn't be paying full price for, right? Things that are in production that are great opportunities for reserved instances. We weren't taking any advantage of that, right? So we really had to take action, and dig in. So to do that, our first, you know, the, the three areas that we focused on first were education. And this education is really on educating ourselves, right? We had to get smart. We had to get into Cost Explorer. We had to understand cl CloudWatch metrics. We had to understand you know, how to extract the data and really see who was driving the bill so we could really prioritize our efforts effectively. Um, secondly, was around governance and, and really lack thereof. We did have some policies in place. We did have tagging requirements in place. However, not a whole lot of enforcement, right? So we had to get some governance in place. But in these early phases, really, you know, it's, it's not the most scalable way, but early on, we would just lock ourselves in a room and start shutting down resources that, we, that were left running, these zombie instances that are out there that you know, don't have any tags on them and are just running 24-7, you know, uh, running up the bill. You know, and just that, that brute force shutdown steps early on, I don't really want to you know, understate the importance of that 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 can have when you're really trying to get your hands on your bill, really from you know, just that education when we were meeting with different stakeholders around what are these resources. And then two, it's, you know, in, in perpetuity, you know, that knowledge is now really implanted with our, with our enablement teams. We also had a lot of uh, top-down support, and I think that that was really important, right? You need that executive support if you're gonna be shutting down resources that, you know, shouldn't be running or, and challenging whether or not certain resource sizes should be used, right? It, it, so having that top-down support was really important, and we, and we had that. You know, we had the directive to get our hands around this bill. And then lastly, the area that we focused on was purchasing. You know, Keith mentioned it. You know, this is a whole new type of purchasing of IT resources. Um, you know, so we knew that these, these instances, uh, EC2 instances and RDS instances that were great candidates for our eyes, you know, we could get a significant discount by going out and making these purchases. So we really focused on that area, but we focused on specific workloads, right? It was a very conservative approach. Like what, spe what specific workloads do we think would be great candidates? And that's the way we, uh, we went after the, our first RI purchase. So we can look at some results here. You know, this graph is similar to what we were looking at earlier. It's showing that EC2 hours growth and it's showing how we were able to flatten that, right? We're flattening that out in the, in the fourth quarter of, of 2017. Um, also worth calling out here, I think, which is really um, impactful is, you know, by one click of the button, right, we're able to get 33% RI coverage on our entire footprint, right? And that, that, that investment in RIs can be, you know, a little scary, especially when it's your first one, and sometimes the size of them can be, can be uh, quite large if you're going for three years. Um, but, you know, I think we were able to see an immediate return of, of value just by you know, taking that approach of, of making a, a really targeted RI purchase in that early on phase. So as Tim said, you know, one click of the button, it's that easy. And with that one click of a button, we actually save 15% in our overall bill. Now, depending on how large your bill is, that can be a pretty significant savings. But we were starting to get into a period of growth here. So this next phase was really all about how are we gonna manage the growth of all these migrations that we knew were ahead of us. So Tim, why don't you talk a little bit about some of the things we did in that area? Yeah, so I think this phase is really more like the first half of 2018. I, I think of it as, you know, early on we were, a lot of the work we were doing was around that enablement 
um, optimizing our enablement work. And now we have this mass adoption out in the different lines of business, all of our different IT clients who are supporting different uh, lines of our dis different businesses, right? And so once you get that mass adoption, you know, you're growing now at scale and you, you can't really focus on, you know, doing some of that manual work that, w that we had done early on to get, to get our hands around the bill. So really in this phase, we focused on, you know, several areas. Um, but I think, you know, first and foremost, is the, you know, that we, we knew we had to do was really drive the transparency, right? Like anyone you talk to around cost optimization will say, you got to get the data into the hands of the consumers, right? It's a whole new concept. This is not sunk cost depreciating on a cost center that's in a, you know, your data center in another division and, you know, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. This is real OPEX hitting every month, right? Um, education, right? So we, we're seeing these things uh, some of these r repeat here, right? But I think it's because it's, it's, it's really to highlight how we're evolving. So where we focus on educating ourselves, now we're talking about educating different consumers in, in IT who are really driving the bill now, right? After this mass adoption is occurring. Um, we hosted some architecting for cost workshops where we create these targeted workshops. We partner with Amazon and we, these workshops were really focused on our specific clients and how they could use certain things like spot instances or RIs or automation to really start optimizing their footprint. And then we really started to focus too on, you know, really getting some policy and automation in place, shutting down some resources, you know, EMR clusters that are left running for longer than three hours, automatically shut down non-prod uh, clusters, right? It's just building in these guidelines that will sort of protect people from making, you know, making decisions that would really drive the bill up without them really knowing, knowing what they were causing. And then the last one I'll call out is uh, on purchasing again. And this one is really this macro approach to RIs. Um, if you remember, I mentioned the, like, that really targeted conservative RI purchase that we made, you know, early on working, figuring out what specific workloads fit were best candidates. You know, once you really get into this growth phase and your floor is always sort of rising and, and ours was, right, our, our cloud program was growing, you can look at and say, well, maybe all, you know, th these workloads don't justify an RI purchase, but maybe all of them together would justify an RI purchase. So then we started making these macro buys that we were kind of executing from the CBO, looking at just kind of the whole heartbeat of, uh, of our consumption. So let's look at uh, some of the impact that we had over this first half of the year. Um, I think what, this is a really gr you know, great graph showing how we were able to decrease our cost by almost 50%. Um, in the lines of business, at our EC2 cost per hour uh, by, over, by almost 50%. And it was really through a lot of that work that, we descri that I described around the, you know, the right sizing and the, and, and the automation and the education, right? Once we were showing people what the impact of their uh, decisions were having on our bill, they started making better decisions. But also, I think probably the, one of the the best outcome of this, you know, besides, and then us making our larger macro or I purchase, you know, we were able to drive some cost uh, per hour improvements there. But was really, this is where we, you know, in this February, January, February timeframe is where we first started introducing the idea of spot fleet and using spot instances. And we really were able to do that through those cost optimization workshops. And that is, you know, an extremely beneficial lever to pull when you're trying to optimize your costs. I mean, you can save up to 70 to 80 percent versus on-demand prices um, just by leveraging some spot, uh, leveraging spot fleet. So that was really how we were able, you know, those kind of three different approaches were how we were able to drive this bill down so drastically over a five-month period. So, Tim, that's a great macro story. I think we have a couple of specific stories that we can share, right? Um, specifically as a result of having these architecting for cost workshops. Can you talk a little bit about some of those examples? Yeah, yeah, I think these, these stories were just, I think, really good stories that we just wanted to, you know, good examples to share, I think, with uh, you know, a venue like this. Um, there was around two separate AWS services. The first one's CloudWatch. Um, if any of you guys are looking at the bill and your bill's been growing, you've probably noticed that you know, uh, the CloudWatch costs can actually end up being a significant amount of your bill if you don't manage it correctly and it can surprise you. So here we have an example um, of where we were on daily spend rate um, for our CloudWatch cost. 
you know, we were kind of going right along at that $500 a day, and then all of a sudden someone made a, a change to something that drove our bill up, you know, five times what it was, right, on, on, a, on, a, daily, on a daily cost. So, you know, we leverage those things like alarms in the Cost Explorer, right, to, to notify us and to, and to give us that heads up. Right? But then we were actually able to sit down and have conversations with the folks that were driving this. And what ended up happening was it was a third-party tool that was ingesting CloudWatch metrics. It was pulling these metrics every five minutes initially. Then it switched to every, well, every one minute it was ingesting the same metrics. Right? That person who had made that change had no idea right, that that was going to drive the bill up you know, by $2,000 a day. Right? So we had that conversation, well, do we need to be having this data ingested every minute? Can it be go back to every five? Or can it go back to every, can it go to every five for non-product counts, right? And I think that was like a great example of how we're now having new conversations that we never really had before in that on-prem model. Um, the second one in my favorite story is with our retail line of business. Um, one of their uh, specific clusters was a huge cluster. It's in the EMR, uh, using the EMR and you know, costing tens of thousands of dollars a month for one cluster. And it was because we were running that cluster every hour, right? The IT teams were running it every hour, the developer teams, they had no idea really about what they were causing on the bill. So when we sat down and talked to them and said, well, let's talk about why we need to run this every, you know, every hour. And it turned out when we brought the business into the conversation and, you know, and now we had all the stakeholders in the room, we were able to see that we could run it every three hours. Right? And so you can see we drastically reduced this to a third of what it was just by having these new conversations. Right? This is like this fundamental shift where you know, like the cloud business office was driving the conversation to have IT and the business really think about you know, the business value associated with those decisions. And I think that's something that kind of gets lost a lot in the on-prem world. You don't have as, uh, a lot of clear visibility in, into your cost sometimes. It's a, you know, allocation or, or a lot of shared services, but here we had direct costs, right? And this was a really great story for us as we were able to, you know, dr drive a conversation around business value. And just those two examples alone actually saved us about $600,000 in our AWS bill. And while that's great, it was reactive, um, so the, the cost was sunk in some regard, we knew phase three really had to be more proactive. So Tim, why don't you talk a little bit about what we're currently doing, because we're currently in phase three to proactively get after the bill. Yeah, I think like proactive is this, this phase that we're in right now, this proactive management, and this is really the ultimate goal, I think, is you know, keep iterating upon being more proactive, right? Not just seeing what increased in the bill yesterday and then going fighting that fire and trying to figure out you know, what's, you know, what's driving the bill that day type of thing. So really, our focus here was around accountability, right? So we were charging back, I mean, we were showing back, as I mentioned previously, doing a lot of education, letting people understand what they were consuming. Then we focused on, you know, setting up a whole chargeback model that we're rolling out in 2019. I think you, ulti you get that ultimate accountability when someone owns the budget. It's not just some other person's budget and some other cost center, it's your budget. So when you make those decisions, you'll be, you know, you're held accountable from a financial performance perspective. Uh, Governance, you know, really enforcing our tagging and using our tagging to implement our chargeback, um, as well as automation. Um, optimization, really looking at different services that we plan to use in the future versus services that, you know, we're not re we didn't want to just react to whenever people started using new services. It was thinking, well, where are we going on this journey? And should we build in automation now when we're not you know, before, this, before the bill gets out of control or before we start spending, let's think about what, how we would want to use some services. And then purchasing again, I think this is a good one for us to, you know, I wish someone would, you know, as said to us last year around, if you're, if you're considering enterprise discount programs with Amazon and you think it's too early to start having those conversations where you can get custom pricing, it's probably not too early. Um, as well as a cloud optimization tool that Keith mentioned. It's probably not too early to start looking at that stuff because it can take some time. Um, these next slides, I, we're just going to go through a couple of the KPIs that, I, that we really start to focus on, and this is really to demonstrate the evolution, you know, where we've come from. You know, we're looking at these macro-level KPIs of total hours and, and uh, total spend and what's, driving the, what's on the bill, and now we're really getting into the weeds here of, like, you know, tr trying to understand how we can optimize 
through leveraging a lot of this automation and, and, the and that's enabled by, by tagging. So here it just shows basically how we were able to implement a new tag. You know, the tags were required. They were always required for the whole year. It didn't mean that people were using them. Um, and I don't know if that's probably a fairly uh, common um, problem, I think. But now we're enforcing it, right? Now we're requiring it um, at when, when those resources are spun up, that those tags have to be applied. Um, another one was around the, uh, where I mentioned service whitelisting, right? Here's just a graph showing our RDS utilization, right? RDS resources in August, we have memory on the y-axis and CPU on the x-axis. It's really showing the utilization of all of our RDS instances in August of this year, right? RDS wasn't a big part of our bill, but we knew it's going to be in 2019. So we implemented some really good policies around default sizing, changing that default sizing to a small instance size so that people aren't using these large instance sizes when they don't need them. You know, if we just look at the same graph of one month change, you can see the impact that we had by implementing this automation, right? So doing this, when it's, if it's only a couple thousand dollars in your bill, but we know that next year is gonna be a big part of it, you know, we already have this in place now. So this is a great example of, you know, kind of how this more proactive approach is taking hold. And then lastly, this is uh, my last KPI slide, and it's really just around, uh, it's probably my, my favorite slide on the, on the deck. It's, um, it's really looking at this new ratio, right? This, this new KPI, coverage by payment option. Um, and this really kind of explains our whole journey. If you look at where we were in December and January and November of last year, leaving reInvent, right? Not one RI, no spot utilization, right? Now we're at a point where we got about 50% of our EC2 is being covered by um, spot or RIs, right? I think that we were able to really drive this optimization through a lot of the efforts over the past year around you know, educating folks um, about, about the spot instance of spot fleet and the benefits associated with it, as well as getting smarter ourselves on you know, when, to, when we could really leverage the reserved instance purchases. So that's been our journey for the last year since we were at reInvent. And there are a few things, lessons learned, if we were to do over again, that we wanted to kind of leave with you for final thoughts. Tim, you want to go through those? Yeah, just real quickly, like something, some things that I wish that people would, you know, what I would have walked out of here with last year. Um, so I'll just go through them quickly. Tagging, right? Like, it's so important for everything, right? You have to implement the tag, uh, tagging policy and enforce it. Right? If we go back to the world living, I think that enforcement is something that we would have done earlier. Um, RI purchases, right? You can use convertible RIs, there's instant sizing flexibility, there's a lot of leverage you can pull so you can make these investments without as much risk of you know, worrying about whether or not you won't use these RIs in, you know, in a year from now. Um, set expectations, we're big, as Megan mentioned, we're a fairly large company. You know, some of these things can take time. Entering an EDP with Amazon or bring, onboarding a third party tool, it can take some time. So really set those expectations. It's probably not too early to start thinking about that. And lastly is just try to be proactive, you know, iterate and automate. You know, we took a really thin sliced approach, really just, and try to iterate on that, right? We're not, not gonna have one perfect automation, like complete policy week one, um, but I think it's just the best approach is you just start chipping away. Uh, you know, and then, you know, a year later, we see that we've implemented a bunch of things. So I think lastly, I'll also show, uh, you know, our journey here and how it really fits into the uh, financial framework that Keith mentioned. And really this is just kind of highlighting our, you know, our, our, our journey from this really manual approach, right, in, uh, in reactive, uh, reactive phase in, uh, you know, early on to really where we are now where we're focusing on chargeback, automation, um, being much more proactive, implementing policies before we start using our resources. And, you know, I think that's really the key where we'll, we'll continue to be in this phase three going forward. You know, and it's, it's you know, it's not something that we're, you, you're, we're ever going to be done. It's const we're going to constantly iterate upon this. Um, so with that, I'll kick it back over to Keith to wrap awesome. up. Great. Awesome story. Love that story. Um, again, one of the reasons why it's so cool is we're focusing on the how. Right? We're also focusing on things that are very obtainable. Again, they were sitting where you're sitting today. Right? And so the things that they're putting in place are having an immediate effect, right? but it's also a continuous journey. Right? So we're going a couple minutes long here, so I want to quickly wrap up. But one of the things I want to acknowledge is 
Take advantage of all the resources that are available to you today and this week. Right? There's things you can do today before you get back to the office that are going to help you get started, get your footing. Right? There's a bunch of resources that are available online. We have a great economics resource center to help provide some of those case studies, those best practices, documentation, white papers. Enable Cost Explorer. Right? Start playing around with the new functionality and what it can do for your organization. Right? Leverage our cost optimization partners. And then really take advantage of the resources this week. We got three, I mean, there's a bunch of sessions this week. There's three that I think are specifically things to t check out, right? Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Tomorrow we got another cost optimization session. Wednesday we have one that's focused on Windows workloads. And then Thursday we have one with Cloud Health and Zendesk that really focuses on building that type of competency center, that center of excellence, that line of business, right? So take advantage of those. With that, I'll thank you for your time. Uh, don't forget to fill out your survey session. Uh, we will be out in the hall there, uh, taking questions and answers since we're a little bit over time. And thank you all for spending your Monday with us.